Hey guys, welcome to The Watch. We're pleased to announce the newly relaunched Ringer.com this week. We are really excited for everyone to see the new site. Check out the latest articles, videos, and podcasts at the Ringer.com. Special thanks to Miller Lite, who have been with us since the beginning and have been fantastic partners to us. We're thrilled to have them as the relaunch sponsor for the site. Miller Lite is the official beer of The Ringer. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me in the studio, becoming unbundled, it's Andy Greenwald! Remember Stack Bundles? I do, RIP, man. Yeah. Uh, Andy, what's up? It's The Watch. It's Thursday. We are coming fresh off a midweek, mid-season mm. episode of Talk the Thrones. I that wouldn't you say can, we're fresh. We are not fresh. We are wilted. But, but we you recorded. can find this episode. We recorded it today with the wonderful Jay Baruchel, who uh, is a huge fan of the us Scottish band Idlewild. And is a big fan of Game of Thrones, oh, more Game importantly. Of Thrones too. <laughs> he joined us. You can find those on The Ringer's Twitter. You can find it on my Twitter, on Andy's Twitter, on Mallory Rubin's Twitter, on Jason Concepcion's award-winning Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, Best in the game. Yeah. Talk the Thrones will be back Sunday night after Game of Thrones ends Mm -hmm. on the East Coast. And as soon as the scenes from next week are over, we jump on there. We break down everything you need to know, everything you didn't know you need to know. And (laughs) we're here today. We're talking about um, some of the news coming out of the TCAs this Mm -hmm. week. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Insecure. Mm -hmm. And we have Justin Charity joining us to talk a little bit about Ozark. It's amazing. And Cucks. This is two topics (laughs) near and dear to your heart. Uh, <laughs> I'm fascinated. I almost want to, to be clear, we're going to talk about Ozark for people who have not seen it, basically. Yeah, I'll have Justin on again I, later for Because I have not seen it. Yeah. And it's I haven't finished it. fascinating to me. Like, yeah. I almost don't want to engage with it because I'm so enjoying the meta narrative of a show that briefly appeared DOA in terms of its critical reception. And secret truth is people just kind of like it. I've seen some blog posts that are like the, the secret summer hit. Yeah. yeah. No, the deep state tried to sink this show. I know. And they couldn't do it. Yeah, leak Am- your memos. Doesn't Am- matter. America likes Ozark. Great. Well, it's been, you know, we like to sometimes turn our eye towards the business. Mm. Oh, by the way, we are part of the Ringer Podcast Network. Mm-hmm. Uh, some podcasts I like on the Ringer Podcast Network. Name them. All of them. Yeah, you know, I'm about to make an appearance on another uh, Ringer Podcast Network show. Tell it, why, don't you, why don't you prompt that? I can't because I don't know when it's going to air, but I was honored. I am honored. I was I got the I got the tap on the shoulder to be on House of Carbs. Honestly, the only podcast I've ever wanted to be on. This, I'm just biding my time here with you. <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, Greenwald's going to be on network. House of Carbs. That's on the Ringer Podcast Network. I was on the first episode of our newest podcast, The Rewatchables. Yeah. With Bill Simmons and Amanda Dobbins. We talked about A Few Good Men. You can subscribe to The Rewatchables. Friendo, you were on the first episode of another podcast. Ringer FC, a soccer podcast with Damn. Ryan O'Hanlon. Michael Peters will be joining us next week. Damn. So we're keeping it busy. You can also hit all the old chestnuts, including Binge Mode, mm-hmm. the NFL show, the NBA show, Mass Man, Big Picture. Jam Session. Achievement-oriented Jam Session, Bachelor Party. I, they're so too too numerous to mention, but they're However, all of a, a certain The ones quality. that we didn't mention will be tweeted at us. I'm sure. Uh, other than that, shout out to Zach Mack, who's our producer, shaved his beard. And we're all feeling fresh because TCAs keep us... Keep us uh, keep us fresh. Well, because we always get new information about streaming television, and we don't go. No, it's interesting. This happens every year now at TCA, but there, you know, this is an event where the many critics, many national critics uh, and regional critics, gather in a ballroom in Los Angeles, and then bang, 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 the networks come through and they bring talent and they do panels. Um, they executives talk about to talk about the state of things, upcoming yeah. projects, and uh, news is broken. And uh, narratives are set. Like, for example, I, I thought we did our best to torpedo Marvels and Humans <laughs> by talking about the trailer, but apparently uh, the knives were out for it. From really? The trailer. What happened? Um, this can be a double edged sword thing because they provided an unfinished pilot to the critics. So they would know, have something to, to talk about when sure. the, the cast came out. Um, but apparently had a lot of green Including screen. Including Ramsey Bolton, right? Yeah, he's on the show. And, and so they watched the sort of unfinished thing that had a lot of temp VFX shots. Yeah. And then Marvel being Marvel were just like, are you ready to accept the greatness of this? And apparently they were not. It's always interesting when the, the room has an ax to grind and the talent on stage just weren't briefed for it, basically. They weren't prepared for it. So like Anson mounts up there making jokes about how as a redneck he could only be cast as a mute character. He said that? Yeah. 
And everyone was just like, but what does this show mean? You're like, <laughs> you'll get it. Don't worry about it. That, that happened. The one time I went to TCA, I saw that happen at the newsroom panel. What, what where happened? Aaron there? Sorkin arrived, like all smiles, and he was didn't realize that everyone in the room was looking at him. Was like, annoyed at him. Yeah. Speaking of Ramsey Bolton, they they were looking at him the way the dogs were looking at Ramsey Bolton <laughs> oh, in his man. final scene. <laughs> so that can happen, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the show is going to be bad. Anyway, all this is to say the, the centerpiece of these TCA things has become – the yearly address by the mayor of television, FX, is John Langrath. Yeah, so he is – is he the, the person who coined peak TV? He's definitely – he's definitely made it his own. Popularized I mean, he, it. He, he's, he's been the one – not to say that – he didn't say it uh, initially or coined the phrase to say that TV's so good now. He coined it to say that this is becoming a bubble and it is unsustainable. And so he has his his wonks basically email – and I still get these emails every year, just the, the sheer – volume of scripted television wonks. and what yeah. that means he's got in-house wonks yeah. um you got to 2017 got to do it um so it was interesting to hear what he had to say this year he is in many ways the most respected uh media executive not just partly because he is by journalists because he's very good at doing this but also he's been very prescient about a lot of things and he was sort of the person who was like in the coming years there will be Hundreds of mm-hmm. scripted television he shows was also, in production. He was also the one who said that you know I think miniseries and anthology series are a way to break up the narrative, you know, and 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 find some basically do something new, get talent under you know get big talent on TV because they only have to sign up for a year. He also, I think this is smart, but he's the 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 wave he chose to ride was you know making these exclusive deals with very talented creators and then basically hitching his wagon to them. And so, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, if there's a year where Louis doesn't want to make Louis, they still have him doing better things in baskets. Sure. Um, you know, Ryan Murphy produces an extraordinary clip, but right. with Noah Hawley, if he doesn't want to do Fargo season four, then there's no Fargo season four, you right. know? And so then that could be a dip for them in some ways. The thing that really came out to me this year that he said, and this leads into our streaming conversation is for a while now he's been taking shots at Netflix. Yeah. And, you know, for them, for their opa- opacity, for not releasing uh, ratings and stuff. Mm-hmm. This was the year when I think everyone finally understood what he was talking about. And he talked a lot about monopolies. <laughs> he was talking about the financial fate of this country. But what he was also saying point blank was, it's very, very hard for there to be, for there not to be a monopoly or a duopoly. When he is working within certain traditional constraints um, of signing talent, of making television shows, of putting things into production, of balancing a budget or whatever. I don't actually know if they have to do that at Fox. But how does he do that when Netflix and Amazon and very soon Apple are just going to be writing checks? Right. So Literally for anything, there are writing two, checks. There, there are in some ways two bubbles, mm-hmm. right? There is the economic bubble mm-hmm. of pretty soon you're going to be asking – consumers to conceivably pay as much in streaming right. subscriptions the next as they are in their already exorbitant monthly cable bill. Well, the idea being if every channel eventually goes over the top, and so you cut the cord from cable, mm-hmm. so you're not paying $200 a month, but then you get um, you get Netflix, you get Hulu, you get Amazon, you get HBO Go, you get Showtime Anytime, you get future versions of FX and AMC – um, maybe you, you, like us, you get Filmstruck, which is super dope. Your bill is almost what yeah. it was with cable. Right. To say nothing of the fact that you still have to pay for an internet connection, yep. which often comes with its own bells and whistles. And, you know, the sort of future that you would look at of hilariously is that you would arrive back at where you originally started, which is, okay, now we need one ring to rule them all. Yep. And I need a box that has all these things in there. And frankly, even now... I am actually noticing, like, it's not annoying. I mean, like, we live in the Jetsons. But, you know, you're sort of clicking around being like, okay, now i got to, like, get into Showtime anytime. And now I'm oh. out of Showtime anytime. And now I'm in OGHBO Go. I do miss channel surfing. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, I wish that the, that the box had caught up to the guide show start. Yeah. Thing. Well, you know? it's something, it's similar to what happened with music when, you know, I downsized and I had to get rid of most of my CD collection. And I basically don't listen to CDs anymore. Um, but I miss just browsing a shelf of CDs that I had and thinking about seeing them, yeah. you know, running into things that you had forgotten about. Now, 
we can have we have access to everything, but it does feel the responsibility of being like now I feel like listening to this particular Cure record from 1987, but you, know, you have to remember it in the moment. Sure, yeah, that's that's one thing, and it would also be like if if and, you know Disney has pulled its content or it's right, pulling so its content off of Netflix and it, to start its own streaming and service. you've got different you know the Netflix originals are only available on Netflix the Amazon originals are only available on Amazon the Hulu originals are only available closed on ecosystem there's the good fight and Star Trek will only be available on CBS all access there's this sort of siloing off of stuff and um, that is different than the music industry because for the most part with the exception of a few releases that eventually then do become like available largely you can get what you need to listen to through point. whatever service I, you're using so there's the economic bubble Right. right. We talked about that. Well, the other aspect that he's also often and talked about is the creative bubble. Yes, the creative bubble. So this is the part that I found fascinating is the idea that if Apple gets involved, if you've got Netflix involved, involved, you've got traditional network television, you've got cable television, you've got premium cable television like HBO, Cinemax, Showtime. That is a lot of demand on possibly a finite amount of talented people. I'm not, Look, this is the... the if you need it, if, if, I'm not disparaging the talents of anybody in particular, but just imagine the NBA is probably too big for my tastes, right? Mm-hmm. Like there are too many teams for the amount of good players and good coaches there are. You could have a 15 team league where there would be like no bad games, no bad coaches, yeah. and, and it would just be incredible. That's not an economically suitable model for the NBA, so they don't do it that way. Television, if there were 10 good shows or if there were 10 shows, there's no guarantee that they would all be good. But you'd have to imagine that the access, the barrier to entry would be, you know, you'd, you'd think that they would go through a development process, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's interesting to say, I mean, yes, he's been talking about this for a while, and I think it is starting to trickle down. Like, you can, it's, on one level, for the consumer, who goes, like, going to an all-you-can-eat buffet, like, it's wonderful that you have almost unlimited choices. There are, there's a show for every, literally every taste, every moment of the day. But there are only so many great scripts. There are only so many stars. Mm-hmm. There are only so many good directors. More crucially, there are only so many veteran line producers. You know, you just go down the call sheet and the credits in terms of the, the talent that you need to make this stuff. That is an issue. But what's also becoming apparent is as we decouple the business from traditional metrics, you can look at the Nielsen ratings and literally not understand what you're looking at anymore because a show that I really love, like AMC's Halt and Catch Fire, like 300,000 people watch that yeah. when it's live, which is, you know, no, no, what's a, you know, no shots or no big upping ourselves, but like we get more than that to uh, talk the thrones. But why does that get four seasons? Um, well, because if you have to go into the arcane data, they make it work. I, AMC owns the show. Whatever, what does it get them in the future in terms of the library? I heard that um, one of the oldest studios, legacy studios, their most profitable show of the last few years is a, and I won't get into the specifics, but is a CW show. Now, why? It's not because of the 0.6 or whatever it gets in the demo. It's because the CW entered into a relationship with, yes, Netflix Mm -hmm. that prepays rights to have these shows after they air. So basically, they didn't even know what the content of the show would be, but they're paying CW $2 million to have it. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes a widget that is valuable to Netflix in a way that it's in a way that makes it valuable to the CW and blah, blah, blah. We are being almost X out of the occasion in their, out of the equation in their expansion. Yeah. That's pretty arcane business stuff. And again, it doesn't matter. If you like that show in the CW, that's great. You get more of it. But it's it's very confusing. But all this is to say, um, I do, I, I remain really impressed by Landgraf because he puts in work in an area of the business that, would be easy to overlook in such a crazy climate, which is the creative side. Yeah. Um, I came in here ready to make a joke about how, uh, just how far in front of his skis Ryan Murphy got when he announced American Crime Story Katrina. Mm -hmm. So for people who don't know this, The People vs. O.J. Simpson, a huge success, critical commercial at the Emmys. Um, When that show was still riding high, Ryan Murphy, the producer, announced, we're going to do this again and next season will be Katrina. Everyone was like, let's just take a beat on that. Mm -hmm. Because... First of all, is Ryan Murphy the guy you want telling that story? Second, what is the narr- what is the what is the narrative of this American tragedy, not just a crime story? But they didn't back down. And I was like, maybe this is, you know, I respect Landgraf because he always supports his talent. So even though it, as it clearly was falling apart, even though they announced Annette Benning and Matthew Broderick and all these names, 
Then they announced American Crime Story Versace coming in ahead of it. They were going to make another crime story ahead of it, one that made more sense. Then I heard, you know, on background, there were showrunners being brought in and showrunners being kicked off, and they had nothing. Today, today, Chris, they announced that this project, American Crime Story Katrina, has partnered with super producer Scott Rudin, who had bought a book called Five Days at Memorial, which is a medical drama about Katrina, mm-hmm. a true story. So basically, they they swallowed, they pack manned up another project to make it the series. Yes. With Sarah Paulson starring as a doctor. And like, now they're like, well, Matthew Broderick, uh, Annette Bening, we'll find roles for you in it. But that's how devoted he was to his creators. He was like, we'll just, you just somehow make this work. I won't get on down your back. I will... The, the, even though critics are beating down the door and want, smelling blood, basically. We aren't going to admit failure here. We're going to make this work. This is also reminiscent of, you know, Fox had their, their up, they're not upfronts, but their TCA yeah. presentation. And Dana Walden talked about how 24 is going to come back and it might not be about CTU. And it's definitely not going to be about the people who are in 24 Legacy. They're just going to take the 24 brand and the 24 concept of the mm-hmm. ticking clock and, apply, mm-hmm. and they think that they can apply it to lots of different stuff. That's interesting. That's interesting. But it's the same thing, like there's this, quote i remember like a while back like max landis had this was talking about this i the ip idea and he's saying like if you're going out and you're pitching like a kind of indiana jones ish adventure story they're gonna ask you to fit it into like could it be the jack daniels movie like literally the whiskey movie this is how this is what's happening now so you're having things that are not necessarily like star wars like american crime story I don't think most people think about the words before OJ when they think of this. That's right. We'll see what happens with the Donatello Versace movie show. And the same thing goes for 24. Like 24 people watch because of Kiefer Sutherland and because it was intense. Not because they think, oh, it's like this malleable, like interesting storytelling device. It's hard not to be jaded. It's very important, I do think, to to just, just see how it's executed. The Lego movie was a terrifying nihilistic idea. I think the movie was really good and really fun. So anything is possible. But it was hard not to be disheartened by Bob Greenblatt, the – I used to call him in battle. He's not. He's doing great. Head of NBC mm-hmm. who who got up in front of the critics and said every every month I call Tina Fey and say, why not more 30 Rock? I call Aaron Greg, Sorkin, Greg say, Daniels, why not West more Wing. The Office, more The West Wing. John Wells, ER. More ER. Let's just – Anything just and it, it sounded. I mean, I'm sure it was delivered in a spirit of these are our classics. Why not? But it it sounds kind of pathetic. It's really hard to launch a show and to get people to watch it. I mean, Will and Grace is coming back, so that was his first success. But you know, and, and I'm someone who pitched a, a West Wing reboot very seriously, not to the network, like in a Grantland yeah. column. But it's it is a smart business play. It goes back to what you know to this idea of TV being our familiar friend. We want to know. We want to see our pals again. We want to see our stories. It's very hard to make Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad. You know, it's it's much easier to do something that has worked before. But it's hard to be a fan of the medium and find this encouraging. So many stuff comes out of these, the TCAs, and just in general with the, over the sort of news transom about television. That like now, I think that it's almost like you know when you've become too accustomed to a drug and you're like, <laughs> so even the news that the Coen brothers are right. coming to Netflix with a Western anthology series called The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. I was like, cool. This was really That's interesting like, to me. I'm going to get like a Coen Brothers Western anthology, and I'm in, I'm excited. I'm excited for the David O. Russell Amazon show. I'm excited for the D- David Fincher Netflix show that's coming out yeah. in three weeks. But it's it's like it's weird. It has like an overall numbing effect because well, there's there's too much. Yeah, I mean, there's too much. The Coen Brothers thing is really interesting because that was announced last winter, and it was the first play by Annapurna Television. And Annapurna, for people who know, is Megan Ellison, daughter of billionaire Larry Ellison's film company that is almost single-handedly saving auteur cinema, right? She just she just bankrolls Paul Thomas Anderson. Mm-hmm. Um, who else? I mean, uh, she they made Zero Dark Thirty in Detroit, right? Yes. Um, they deserve a ton of credit. They will they will put money behind projects that in today's Hollywood might not be might may not be supported. So they launched a TV division because everyone does TV, and the first thing they announced was this Coen Brothers thing. And I asked around, and the the response I kind of got about it was, this is basically them wanting to make a splash as a TV department, and they took they asked the Coen brothers if they had something, and they would kind of break it into a TV show. It was a movie. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, it ends up at Netflix, and it sounds like a TV show. Yeah. It's- and and to end this conversation, we can end with the Coen brothers' comment on this: We are streaming, motherfuckers. I mean. God bless them. That is shows that that is them showing the exact amount of seriousness this deserves, and just also how engaged with this they are. But it's 
it's surprising. You know, I, I let's just we should, what we should, the way to end it is basically the way Landgraf did. He did spend three years up there um, naysaying and doom and glooming it. Mm-hmm. This year he walked it back, and that that this was all going to end soon. But the thirst for this is not ending. And you know, once Apple gets involved, Apple, the most valuable company in the history of the world, again this month, if they want to start throwing millions and billions at this, then. That raises this, raises the, the water level for everyone. It's not going away soon. We'll be back in a couple of minutes to talk about Insecure and Ozark with Justin Charity. But first, a quick word from our sponsors. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Hotel Tonight. If you are like me and you are not so great at planning ahead, I have got good news for you. There's this awesome app called Hotel Tonight that helps you find amazing hotel deals at the last minute. It sounds counterintuitive, but unlike flights, hotel rates usually get cheaper at the last minute. And Hotel Tonight helps hotels sell their unsold rooms, allowing them to pass those deals onto you. These are not last resort places. They are actually cool, top-rated hotels that you want to stay in. And with so many awesome partner hotels in a ton of different countries, Hotel Tonight can help you find a great hotel almost anywhere. It's perfect for a spontaneous getaway or finally going on that trip you've been wanting to take for a while. Greenwald? Yeah, man. I I can't tell you. Hotel Tonight just coming in huge with the Ryan family Tahoe trip coming oh, up. I've heard. We, first of all, we've all heard a lot about this. I can't wait. Maybe do a little bit of, uh, you know, do a little jet skiing around Lake Tahoe. Can I ask you something? Snow-capped mountains. Real question. Mm. Where is Lake Tahoe? Nevada. But isn't um, it California, too? Yeah, it's the border. Uh, because even did, though the know. app's name is Hotel Tonight. That's the thing. You can book up to a week in advance, so you can use it as a planning tool. All it takes 10 seconds, three taps, and a swipe, so get in on these killer last-minute deals and download the Hotel Tonight app now. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Stitch Fix. If you are like a lot of guys, you could probably think of a million things you'd rather be doing than shopping for clothes. Between the parking and the crowds at the mall and the endless browsing and the lack of advice online, it's enough to make you want to rock the same T-shirt and jeans forever, but you can't. So let me tell you about Stitch Fix Men. They've reimagined how to find and buy clothes. And you never even have to leave the house. It's that easy. Just go to stitchfix.com and tell them your sizes, your favorite type of clothes, and how much you want to spend. Your personal stylist then gets to work handpicking new clothes for you based on the style and the budget. Five items are delivered straight to your door. You try them on at home, and you only pay for what you keep. Shipping is free on both ends, so anything you don't want, you just send it back, and exchanges are always free, too. You can get your fix monthly, quarterly, or whenever you feel like it. There's no subscription required. It's easy. The shipping is free. Why not give them a try? I promise you will get hooked. Get started now at stitchfix.com watch, and you'll get an extra 25% off when you keep all five items in your box that's stitchfix.com slash watch to get started today stitchfix.com slash watch okay greenwald we're back uh really quickly because you've been I, I haven't gotten a chance to catch up on season two of insecure and it just got renewed for a third season uh we have justin coming on to talk about ozark in a minute or two mm-hmm. tell me why i should be watching insecure first right of now. all i'm a little salty you got backup in your attempts to convince me I to did. watch something. This is just, I'm just a guy sitting in front of a microphone, sitting in front of another guy, while another guy twiddles a keyboard, making a case for Insecure. Okay. Insecure made the leap, man. We both enjoyed the pilot. I think we watched one or two last year. I watched the whole season. We gave it positive. Yeah. We didn't talk about it again. Yeah, we yeah. gave it positive feedback, and then we kind of didn't talk about it yeah. anymore. And I don't even think that was a shot at the show. It didn't... In some ways, it didn't feel like it forced its way into the conversation or we watched it at our own pace. Um, This show made a major leap between season one and season two, and it did it in the best possible way, which is just becoming a more confident and clearly realized version of itself. So for people who haven't watched it, it it is the brainchild of Issa Rae, who is a – she made some web series that were quite popular, and she stars in this. She writes a lot of it. Um, It's about a young woman trying to make it in Los Angeles. Um, I should add a young woman of color because that's one of the most important aspects of the show in a really beautiful and uh, under, I would say understated way. Um, the show is set in Los Angeles, but it's set very much in Inglewood. And the show makes Inglewood and everyone on it look incredible. A lot of that goes to Melina Matsukas, who's the director of a lot of the episodes. She's like Beyonce's style. What, I don't even understand what her role. She's like Beyonce's creative director Okay, often. you know, yeah. She directed the formation video and a bunch of other things. This show looks like nothing else on TV, and it looks terrific. But beyond that, it is so enjoyable, especially this season, which 
you know, the last season, the character of Issa was sort of struggling in work and in life. She had a, a boyfriend who was um, in, a, in a bad state, mm-hmm. and just sleeping on the couch. Yeah. She cheated on him. They broke up. So this season, they are both in what the character Issa would term their hoe phases, um, <laughs> which makes for some very, very funny television. But it's just hitting all those buttons that we have been coming back to a lot recently. We mentioned it when we were talking about Glow, which is... I'm here. I'm here for these people. I'm here for this world. I'm here for Issa's friend group of supporting characters, all of whom are so clearly drawn immediately that it's just fun and funny to be around them. You and I, we are both here for Yvonne Orji, who plays um, Issa's best friend, Molly, who remains one of the funniest characters She's on television incredible. and one of the best performances on television. Um, I, I just think the show is doing... I think it's. I think it has become a truly worthwhile, strong, compelling, pleasurable TV show that is, it's doing some really subtle emotional stuff yeah. that a lot of other shows aren't doing. And I love that it's doing it in a way, just to come back to it, that it looks so good. You know, it, it we, we, we have been praising shows. There's been a trend to praise personal point of view shows um, p- purely for their idiosyncratic point of view without really giving much thought to just how this looks as an experience. Visu- I mean, just cinematically, right? And I, I don't even mean to take shots at at, at at that whole genre of shows and whether it's, um, you know, uh, Better Things or One Mississippi or Louis, the one that started it all, which obviously has a directorial flair to it. But I like that this could be dismissed as a small show because it's about small, relatively relatable characters and smaller emotions and smaller stakes, but that it looks like the very best television has to offer. And, they, and that they went for it. You know, it, it, I'm, I feel like I'm using the kind of language I use when I talk about how an indie artist made the jump to a major sure, label right. and then did it right, took advantage of the studio. That's what Issa Rae did. She's become an even better performer. The writing is even sharper. Going to get you to watch this season. I'm watching. I'm going to check it out. And, uh, you sold me. Yeah, I really recommend it, Didn't need it, to be man. sold. I just didn't have the time. It is, it is, a, it is a pleasure. I want to make sure that people uh, watch it. But does it come on before or after Thrones? I think after. Yeah, so definitely watch Talk to the Thrones first. Right. And then watch, right. watch it. Then, because look out for us first. I'm going to recommend a show that I've recommended before yeah. that uh, you don't need to worry about when it comes on because it's on the streaming television platform, Netflix. And That's to one do of the it, popular ones. I'm bringing on the J.R. writer of the Dipset Marty Bird gang, Justin Charity. Hey, Justin, what's up? Hello. I needed to Hi, call guys. in the big guns. <laughs> because here's the thing about the Ozark archive. I don't know if it's like a, it's more like a holler. I, it's, it's more like a, a community uh-huh. that lives in the hills. Uh, that seems less money. cool than a hive. Yeah. S- SEAL Team 6. Here's the team, here's my SEAL Team 6 of Ozark watchers. Uh-huh. Me, mm-hmm. I, I'm not on the team. It's Justin Charity. Yeah. It's Jason Gallagher. Uh-huh. Ryan O'Hanlon's mom. <laughs> <laughs> Shouts to Mrs. O'Hanlon. Oh, man. And the drummer from The Killers. Yeah, Vinuch. Those are the people who love Ozark the way I love Ozark. Okay. Yeah, and it's, a, it's pretty pretty good squad there. Great summer show, incredible watch, and so entertaining. And I know you haven't watched it yet, but I wanted to bring Justin on because Justin was one of the first people who was like, I, I not, I already, I already took it down. But I'm going to seed the stage. Let me just say this: I, I'm excited for you guys to to convince me on this because this whole phenomenon surprises me. Because the the response to this show when it debuted on Netflix last month was weirdly uniform and in the critical tv critical consensus community like this kind of consensus is is rare and the the consensus was this is this is what's wrong with with <laughs> peak tv <laughs> it is they were, they were like ever these are more people who took the wrong lessons from the success of breaking bad and mad men it's another mm-hmm. brooding anti-hero it's blah blah you know and I felt very confident, yeah, very confident in giving this a miss. This and is then, what explains me and Justin's pivot to populism. Yeah, well, <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> then, then the rumbling started, and you guys are having the time of your life. So I want to know how do I become like you, Justin? You take it away, man. Well, first of all, I'm I'm like a deficient example, right? In so much as I never watched Breaking Bad, like a lot of the the TV that I think those right. critics are probably very saturated in is just a, a lot of TV that I missed, and so. I'm not as sort of like set up to be burnt out on Mm -hmm. this sort of character, this sort of protagonist. Um, And I think beyond that, I think this is such a, I think Ozark is such a simultaneously like it codes as a thoughtful show, but it's also just very trashy. Yes. And it's trashiness is, is very important to why I consumed it. 
uh, in the manner of fast food. My, my ears are pricking up. Is. Yeah, <laughs> this is actually working for me because what I don't the, – the takeaway I got from the criticism was that it was another self-serious, you know, incredibly soggy, heavy – exploration of one man's tortured psyche and i'm just kind of over that but if they embrace kind of pulp uh in- insanity like if it's fun yeah on some level even if the characters aren't having fun okay i'm here for this so, so all right keep going well yeah, justin I'm, i know that you working. said that um like you're not you, you you're not particularly saturated by like some of the ptv tropes that maybe ozark is playing with yeah but one of the things i really like about the show is that so often on on new shows especially but in any show you're supposed to have this audience cipher that's like or this this audience proxy that's supposed to be going into this world for you, and they're like they're scandalized by everything. They're morally, you know, th- they're having these moral complications because of what they're doing. And the best thing about Ozark is that almost to a person, nobody skips a beat when shit goes down. It right. just is like let's <laughs> no, let's do it. Let's go to the Ozarks and launder money. Yeah, <laughs> is, that, is that a spoiler? <laughs> no, it's like no, in the no, trailer. No. I mean, no, it's, it's in the yeah. So yeah, I mean, do you, when it comes to like the pacing and the storytelling, what is it that you like? It's weird because like so the, the show centers around this family. It's sort of like these these uh, uh, husband and a wife who are on the outs a little bit, and they're two kids. And I, you know, if there's anything about the show that I maybe, um, and I should say I finished the show, but that I wanted to congeal a bit more is I wanted to see a bit more scenes of the kids. Um, and which is of, something people uh, rarely say about crime. Yeah. shows. Yeah. It's weird. It's like, I think like, I think that it's, it's the sort of thing that because I feel like I, I am invested in the family tentatively in mm. Ozark that I am excited for a season two of Ozark. Um, You're already on hopefully. season two. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm telling you, I'm ready. <laughs> what, what does this show? I, this, I'm going to throw this to both of you guys. What what need or what hunger does this show satisfy, even if it's one that you didn't know you had in your entertainment diet? What does this feed? Because, Financial planning. Well, this is because Chris well, well, really is. I, I, I honestly can't <laughs> tell the parts that are making you excited or not. I can't I tell like, what you're being serious. Why about. am I investing in Netflix when I could be invested in the I, Blue Cat the Bla- Blue Cat Lounge? Well, it's true. The like a valuable thing is that this show does do the very the exceedingly practical episode of like I guess we have to explain what money laundering yeah. is and okay. how it works. Um, do you remember helpful. the tension that used to surround Breaking Bad, Andy, where it was like, when is Walt's secret going to come out? And yeah. like, or even like Mad Men, where it's like, when is Don's secret going to come out? Like when when it yeah. happens on Ozark. They're just like, yeah, my bad. I lied about that. <laughs> and they, and that's they actually a great scene. Yeah. Oh, it's such a great scene. No. So, so, so what, you, what you're getting at here is that it messes with our it's, – it's interesting. So you, what you're saying is that the show actually actively messes with our peak TV expectations. Sure. Yeah, for me. For Justin, can, it's different because he's not necessarily coming at it like, oh, this is a Don Draper moment. Can, can I throw one other thing at you guys that I've just learned due to some heavy Googling mm. while we're talking? I can multitask. <laughs> just, just I, I don't mean to be rude, but – the creator of the show, Bill Dubuque, is also the mind behind films like The Accountant yeah. and The Judge. Yeah, so he likes <laughs> The Judge. He, yeah. he likes clerical work. These are yeah. both <laughs> films that, to the surprise of literally everyone, <laughs> got, have, made. got made and got also made. became like weirdly popular. Like, Chris, we yeah. talked about The Judge oh, on yeah. this podcast. Now, to be fair, not because I saw it in the theater, but because when I was on a plane last year, I saw someone else watching it and saw the scene where Robert Duvall soils himself yeah. in Robert Downey Jr.'s house. So, obviously, I'm, I'm on Dubuque's team here. <laughs> But he does see this guy seems to be able to speak to the the viewing public in a way that bypasses the traditional apparently yeah you know the the, the coastal elites if you will although well, you guys I say, are both coastal elites well one thing that I I guess um you know you you were talking about like critical consensus and um you know I feel like people have glommed on to the idea of like Jason Bateman's character in the show being a sort of like brooding white guy Mm anti-hero but i I think the thing that's important about ozark is that it is a very precise it's like a very precise like it's a very precise characterization of a cuck and it is a like ozark (laughs) from jump is this like fever dream now you're talking my language (laughs) it's this fever dream of like the red pill reddit community and i think that's what's fascinating about the show is that there are people i think who i like read their reviews or i see them tweeting about it and it's like 
white guys. Am I right? And like, that's yeah. the sort of critique of the yeah. show. But to me, it's like, that's the thing about the show that makes the show work is that it is this sort of, it's this red pill fever dream of this guy who resents his wife and is sort of like making yeah. a mess of his life for really selfish reasons. But the show is self-aware about that. Like it's not, it's not really trying to mythologize Jason Bateman so much as it's sort of trying to carry that outlook and that mindset to its natural conclusions. I, I, this is a very compelling argument. Well, I and really also like the this. thing that he does in this show is essentially switch tabs all the time. Like switch yeah. browser tabs. <laughs> yes, because they'll just be like, good way of putting I'm it. in a lot of trouble, but I don't really care that much. I'm going to switch tabs and go hang out with this other person. It's never right. like, God, he's like, there's one part of the show where he doesn't sleep for a little while and he gets a little punchy. But like us today, for the most part, he's like working the problem. And then like when he gets like in a, in a bind, he's just kind of like, nah, I'll leave. I'll talk <laughs> my way out of I it. I like this. And I, and I also just to make this conversation come full circle. Even though I was once a very proud card-carrying member of the critical consensus community, mm. I'm kind of glad that things like this can still bubble up and around that because and – and I don't want to speak for any of the critics that, that dismissed the show early on. I, I wonder if some of them have revisited it or, you know, or, or will give the time – or spend more time on it. But um, – it's real. That job is essentially, I think, impossible now. And I think there are some incredible writers who do their best. But, you know, you don't get much time to process this stuff. And it's very hard when you're when there are so many shows out there to give each individual um, exercise the attention that it deserves. Right. Because everything you guys are saying about the show, the way you're receiving it and the little details that make it unique sound incredibly compelling to me and interesting. But I also think those sound like things that might be difficult to discern from one or two screener episodes sandwiched between six other new dramas that debuted last month. Yeah, I just it's like it just has an ex excellent pilot and then it doesn't slow down once it gets to the, the sort of destination that it's going. Justin, who's your sort of non Bateman Linney favorite character? Oh, uh, um, Dell. I just, I don't know. I, it's weird. Like Dell, Del. I, I was talking to, I was talking to Allison Herman. This is the, um, the drug or, executioner. <laughs> yeah. That would be my favorite her. character. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was talking to our, you know, uh, our colleague Allison Herman and w like, I think it was like live texting her when I was binge watching the show, unfortunately, but like all of the scenes with Dell after a point, and, and this gets to what I was saying earlier about trashy, all of the scenes where Dell and Bateman are talking remind me of why I loved burn notice <laughs> like, yeah. way. Yes. Like, I used yeah. to love burn notice. And like, that's the, that's the dynamic. Like I, I get that, like maybe the way that the show is sort of marketed and lit and presented, maybe uh, sort of drape it in this aura of, of peak TV uh -huh. as it were. But again, it's like, there's something that is quasi procedural, you know, about, um, the way yeah. that Bateman and Wendy or like Laura Lenny work through it's, this sort of it's almost conflict. yeah and they, he has like a problem of the episode that he has to solve right. and then he kind of just goes about doing it with or without the help of his family I I really like uh, it's worth mentioning that Julia Garner and uh, oh, Jordan Spiro Julia Garner. Are, are Jordana Spiro are both, the mob doctor herself they're both really good man <laughs> Jordana Spiro basically here's the gig it was like do you want to be on the show Ozark you just have to walk from a dock to a bar and say something sassy. So she's the Kenneth Branagh of Ozark? Basically, yeah. She's like, it's home. Just, uh, yeah. I, um, I love her. Look, I really like that you mentioned Burn Notice because I do think that one of the unfortunately overlooked TV trends of this century was USA's character's welcome run. Yeah, I mean yeah. that. Not by real. No, seriously. Yeah. Yeah, but he, here's the thing about those shows, and I didn't watch very many of them, and none of them regularly, but here's what they were. Entertaining, yeah. dependable, uh, pleasurable. You Did know? you watch Suits, Justin? I didn't. I never got into Suits. But, okay. but everyone has one that they've you know yeah. dipped in and out of. I did like Burn Notice the few times I watched it. I liked it. Royal Pain. But <laughs> that was one necessary roughness. I mean, they were boilerplate, but here's the thing. like The, the years that USA was, was just doing very well with those on cable were the years that NBC was completely in the wilderness precisely because it didn't make shows like USA was making, even yeah. though they're corporate siblings. Like The lessons from – the last 15 years of TV shouldn't be overlooked. Lessons like, you know, we can challenge the audience, we can have difficult characters, difficult men. But the lesson of TV full stop from the beginning through characters welcome through today is people watch this stuff to be entertained. 
and to fall into patterns with shows, to watch characters who do things, even if they surprise you with the outcomes, in do them in ways that become predictable to the audience. The trick is hiding that, right? But sure. if you're saying, like, it's Jason Bateman hiding tabs and solving problems, and then Jordan Hespiro walking off of a dock, and you know you're going to get that in every episode, it's no wonder it's successful. Any, yeah. la- any last la- last thoughts about uh, Ozark for the people, Justin? Well, okay, so how far... You, you said you're at episode six, I'm at, right? I'm, yeah, I'm at episode six. Oh, so man. I was going to probably finish it this weekend. Maybe I'll have you back on and we can do the spoiler. Yeah, I was going to say, the, the problem with it being the SEAL Team 6 of Ozark fandom is that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that you, it's just the number of people I can talk to. Yeah. The people that are read in. Well, we'll people have, that are read in the show. It's so get, limited. <laughs> who's read in? All right, well, maybe we'll have you uh, we'll have you back on really soon just to, to do the spoilerific full season talk. We also have to have you back when I watch three episodes and decide that I hated it and to take back everything no, that I said. you're going to like it. You're going to oh, like nah, it. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. You're going to like it. You, All right. you guys sold me. Good job. Justin, thank you so much for calling in. No problem. Talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Okay, thanks for uh, joining us, Justin Charity. Andy, we uh, talked about a lot of stuff today. We got Game of Thrones. Talk the Thrones is Sunday after the East Coast episode, uh, the East Coast airing of Game of Thrones. We'll be back Monday mm-hmm. to chat. Maybe we'll do a little peaks catch up if we can. We got to. Still still my favorite thing on TV. Great. All right. So we'll be back Monday. Talk about all the usual suspects. Until then. Great job, Yeah, keep it real. Keep it real. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Hotel Tonight. Things change, the weather changes, your mood definitely changes, so why lock yourself into plans that might change? With Hotel Tonight, you don't have to, because you'll get incredible deals on awesome hotels, even at the last minute. Booking on Hotel Tonight gives you the freedom and flexibility to play things by ear, while knowing you'll score a great price and a great place to stay. So download the Hotel Tonight app and find seriously amazing deals now.